Chapter 7 Spiritual Virility So far I've discussed the roles that the sacred, the gods, the priestly class, and the rites played in traditional societies. In the world of tradition, these things hardly correspond to categories typical of the domain of religion in the current sense of the word. Based as it is on the notion of deities conceived as self-sufficient beings, and of the notion of God as a personal being who, providentially, rules the universe. Moreover, the cult is essentially characterized by an effective disposition and by a sentimental and devotional relationship of the believer to this supreme being or deities. In this type of relationship, the moral law plays a fundamental role. One would look vain for religion in the original forms of the world of tradition. There are civilizations that never named their gods or attempted to portray them. At least this is what is said about the ancient Pelasgians. The Romans themselves, for almost two centuries, did not portray their deities. At most, they represented them with a symbolical object. What characterizes the primordial times is not animism, the idea that anima is the foundation of the general representation of the divine and of the various forces at work in the universe, but rather the idea or perception of pure powers, adequately represented by the Roman view of the noumen. The noumen, unlike the notion of deus, as it later came to be understood, is not a being or a person, but a sheer power that is capable of producing effects, of acting, and of manifesting itself. The sense of the real presence of such powers, or noumena, as something simultaneously transcendent and yet imminent, marvelous yet fearful, constituted the substance of the original experience of the sacred. A well-known saying of Servius emphasizes that in the origins, religion consisted in nothing else but experience. Even though more conditioned points of view were not excluded from exotericism, those traditional forms reserved for the common people, inner doctrines were characterized by the teaching that the personal forms of deities variously objectified are only symbols of super-rational and superhuman ways of being. As I have said, the center consisted in the real and living presence of these states within an elite, or in the ideal of their realization through what in Tibet is called the direct path, and which generally corresponds to initiation conceived as an ontological change of nature. The saying from the Upanishads that best represents the traditional inner doctrine is, quote, So whoever worships another divinity than his self, thinking he is one and I another, he knows not. He is like a sacrificial animal for the gods, end quote. With regard to the rite, there is nothing religious about it, and little or no devout pathos in those who performed it. The rite was rather a divine technique, a determining action upon invisible forces and inner states similar in spirit to what today is obtained through physical forces and states of matter. The priest was simply a person who, by virtue of his qualification and the virtus, intrinsic to the rite itself, was capable of producing results through this technique. Religion was the equivalent of the indigitamenta of the ancient Roman world, namely of the body of formulations used with different noumena. Thus, it is easy to see that prayers, fears, hopes, and other feelings displayed before what was the character of Newman had as little meaning and effect upon it as if one of our contemporaries were to employ prayers when confronting a machine. Instead, what was at stake was to be able to understand such relationships so that once a cause was established through a correctly performed rite, a necessary and constant effect would ensue on the plane of powers and invisible forces and states of being. Thus, the law of action reigns supreme. But the law of action is also the law of freedom. No bond can be spiritually imposed on beings with neither hope nor fear, but rather act. Thus, in the older Indo-Aryan view of the world, only the Brahmana caste, consisting as it did of superior natures, could tower over everybody else since it ruled over the power of the right, or of Brahman understood in this context as the vital and primordial principle. The gods themselves, when they are not personifications of the ritual action, that is, beings who are actualized or renewed by this action, are spiritual forces that bow before this caste. According to the Far Eastern tradition, 
the person who has authority also enjoys the dignity of a third power between heaven and earth. In ancient Egypt, even the great gods could be threatened with destruction by priests who knew special sacred incantations. Kemotef, his mother's bull, was a title of the Egyptian king, emphasizing that as a man, the king possesses the primordial substance. He affects the divine more than being affected by it. One of the formulations recited by the Egyptian kings before the performance of the rites was, O oh gods, you are safe if I am safe. Your doubles are safe if my double is at the head of all living doubles. Everybody lives if I live. Formulations of glory, power, and total identification are recited by the soul, rendered like Osiris, in the course of its trials. These trials, in turn, can be assimilated to various degrees of solar initiation. Similar traditions are perpetuated wherever in Alexandrian literature mention is made of the holy race of people without kings, a race autonomous and immaterial that acts without being acted upon. This race is believed to be endowed with a sacred science centuries old that is proper to the lords of the spirit and of the temple and communicated only to kings, princes, and priests. This science is related to the rituals of the pharaohs and later on it came to be known in the western world as Ars Regia. In the higher forms of the luminous Aryan spirituality, whether in Greece, ancient Rome, or the Far East, the role played by doctrine was minimal. Only the rituals were mandatory and absolutely necessary. Orthodoxy was defined through rituals and practices and not through dogmas and theories. Sacrilege and impiety did not consist in not believing, but rather in neglecting rites. This does not amount to formalism, as modern historians who are more or less influenced by a Protestant mentality would have us believe, but rather to the pure law of spiritual action. In the Doric Achaean ritual, the relationship with the divine was not based on feelings, but on an attitude characterized by do ut dis. Even the gods presiding over funerals were not treated very religiously. They did not love men, nor were they loved by them in return. The reason behind their cult was to propitiate them and to prevent them from exercising an unfavorable action. The expiatio itself originally had the character of an objective operation, such as the medical procedure for an infection, without resembling either a punishment or an act of repentance on the part of a soul. The formulations employed by every patrician family and by every ancient city in their relationship with the forces controlling their destinies had been previously employed by their divine forefathers to overcome spiritual forces, noumena. Thus, these formulations were merely the legacy of a mystical domain. They were not the effusion of feelings, but a supernaturally efficacious weapon, provided that not a single technique was changed in the course of the rite. Wherever the traditional principle was applied in its entirety, it is possible to find, in its hierarchical differentiations, a transcendent virility that finds its best symbolical expression in the synthesis of the two attributes of the Roman patrician class, namely the lance and the rite. There, one also finds beings who are regis sacrorum, innerly free, and often consecrated by Olympian immortality. With regard to invisible and divine forces, these beings exercise the same function of centrality, and the same role that leaders exercise among human beings. A very long downward path or degenerated process unwinds from this peak to what is currently and commonly considered religion and priesthood. The world of animism represents a fall from an attenuation of the world perceived under the species of powers and of noumena. This attenuation and degeneration was destined to increase with the shift from a world in which souls were inherent in things and in the elements to a world in which the gods were conceived as persons in an objective sense rather than as figurative allusions to non-human states, forces, and possibilities. When the efficacy of the rite disappeared, man was motivated to give a mythological individuality to those forces with which he had previously dealt according to simple relationships of techniques or which, at most, he had conceived under the species of symbols. Later on, man conceived these forces in his own image thus limiting human possibilities. He saw in them personal beings who were more powerful than he was and who were to be addressed with humility, faith, hope, and fear, 
not only to receive protection and success, but also liberation and salus, in its double meaning of health and salvation. The hyper-realistic world that was substantiated with pure and sheer action was replaced with a sub-real and confused world of emotions, imagination, hopes, and fears. This world became increasingly human and powerless as it followed various stages of the general involution and alteration of the primordial tradition. Only vis-a-vis -vis this decadence is it possible to distinguish the regal and the priestly functions. Even when a priestly class ruled without departing from the pure traditional spirit, as in the case of ancient India, it had a much more magical and regal rather than religious character, in the usual sense of the word religious. When I say magical, I do not mean what today the majority of people think when they hear the term magic, which is almost always discredited by prejudices and counterfeits. Nor do I refer to the meaning the term acquires when referred to the sui generis, empirical science typical of antiquity, which was rather limited in its scope and effects. Magic, in this context, designates a special attitude towards spiritual reality itself, an attitude of centrality that is closely related to regal tradition and initiation. Secondly, it does not make sense to emphasize the relationship between the magical attitude, the pure ritual, the impersonal, direct, and numinous perception of the divine, and the way of life of savage tribes, which, according to the Judeo-Christian mentality, are still unaware of true religiosity. In most cases, savage tribes should not be considered as pre-civilized states of mankind, but rather as extremely degenerated forms of remnants of very ancient races and civilizations. Even though the above-mentioned particulars are found among savage tribes and are expressed in materialistic, dark, and shamanic forms, this should not prevent us from recognizing the meaning and the importance they assume once they are brought back to their true origins. Likewise, magic should not be understood on the basis of those wretched and degenerated remnants, but rather on the basis of the forms in which it was preserved in an active, luminous, and conscious way. These forms coincide with what I have called the spiritual virility of the world of tradition. It does not come as a surprise that most noted modern historians of religion have no idea whatsoever about this concept. The confusions and the prejudices found in their highly documented works are most unfortunate.